So what I want to do uh, this morning is talk to you about some of the newer treatments that are coming through for ovarian cancer, which are targeted to specific abnormalities within the, within the cancer cells and the cancer environment, and just touch on where we are at the moment in terms of selecting the right treatments for the right uh, patients. As Janos um, explained to you earlier, this traditional and still very important treatment strategy for ovarian cancer is multimodality treatment. And so that means that the majority of ladies who have ovarian cancer, particularly advanced ovarian cancer with a cancer is spread outside of the pelvis, will be treated with a combination of both surgery and chemotherapy. And as Jadros mentioned, the scheduling of whether we start with surgery or with chemotherapy depends on factors relating both to how well the patient is, what um, other illnesses they may have, and also to the extent of the cancer. So many patients will have surgery up front, what we call primary uh, cytoreductive surgery, and that will be followed up by a course of, of chemotherapy. But many patients, increasingly now, because of, of the extent of their disease or because they've got other medical problems, are having chemotherapy first. And that's what we call primary chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And they will have three or four cycles of treatment prior to surgery, and they will complete the rest of their chemotherapy after their operation. As many of you are aware, the standard chemotherapy that we use for, for all types of ovarian cancer is a combination of carboplatin and paclitaxel or taxol. And we give this treatment into the veins. It takes about five hours to infuse. And the treatment is generally given every three weeks uh, for six uh, doses of treatment. And although this is effective for the majority of patients, it comes um, at a cost in terms of, of side effects. And many of you will be very familiar uh, with these side effects. Uh, so mild uh, uh, sickness with carboplatin and, and, and taxol, problems with, with low blood counts, a risk of infection um, and bleeding with both chemotherapy agents, and the possibility, particularly with, with, with carboplatin, of, of developing an allergy uh, to treatment, particularly in ladies who require more carboplatin in the future uh, when their cancer has recurred. Uh, Paclitaxel comes with additional uh, side effects, so we know uh, nearly every lady who has treatment will lose their hair completely during the course of the treatment. And about one in four and one in five ladies that has the treatment will also get some, some damage to their nerve endings. They will get uh, tingling um, and numbness, particularly in their fingers and their toes, which can be uh, quite troublesome, and, it, and in a minority of ladies, uh, can be long-standing after they've finished uh, their chemotherapy. There's been a lot of research uh, recently looking to see how we can actually make our initial chemotherapy uh, with carboplatin and paclitaxel more, more effective. And there have been two strategies that have been, been adopted. One of those is rather than giving the chemotherapy into the veins, to actually infuse some of the chemotherapy actually directly into the abdominal cavity, what we call intraperitoneal uh, treatment. And there have been some studies that have shown that that may potentially be a more effective way of giving chemotherapy but it comes at a cost because it's more complex and it also seems to be associated uh, with more um, side effects. The other approach that's uh, gone to do a great deal of interest in the last five years is actually to change the way that we give chemotherapy. So traditionally, as we can see in, in, in the top uh, section of, of the slide on the right, we give the chemotherapy, as we said, for six doses once every three weeks. But there's been a lot of work looking particularly um, at splitting the paclitaxel up into smaller doses, but giving them more frequently. So giving that chemotherapy weekly for 18 weeks alongside having the carboplatin once every uh, three weeks. And there was a large trial that was published in uh, Japan four or five years ago, which showed that having the paclitaxel uh, weekly was more effective in the first round of chemotherapy than having the treatment once every three weeks. And as, as Henry said, we've been involved in a, in a very big trial um, in the UK and international, the ICON-8 uh, trials, which is actually uh, looking in more detail at the weekly scheduling of chemotherapy and also giving that weekly scheduling along Avastin, alongside Avastin or Bevacizumab, which I'll talk about um, shortly. But what we know, as Suda explained earlier, is that ovarian cancer is not uh, one disease. And even when we look at the, uh, ovarian cancer under the microscope, we can clearly divide it up into five or six uh, different subtypes of ovarian cancer, the most common of which is the high-grade serous uh, cancer, which you've heard a lot about um, already uh, this morning. And we know, unfortunately, that although the chemotherapy is effective for the majority of, of ladies, about 25% of those ladies who have 
uh, carboplatin and, and paclitaxel uh, based chemotherapy have a recurrence of their ovarian cancer uh, within uh, 12 months and often the chemotherapy is not as effective as we would like in getting the cancer back under control at that time. So the question that's emerged over the last 10 years is whether we can make the treatment for ovarian cancer, the drug treatment, more effective by giving targeted therapies alongside or possibly instead of our chemotherapy treatment. So what do I mean by a, a, a targeted therapy? Well, we know there are lots of differences between normal cells and between cancer cells, and it's those differences that allow the cancer cells to divide uh, more quickly, to grow and to spread. And what targeted therapies have been designed to do is take advantages of some of those specific uh, differences between normal um, and cancer cells. And there have been drugs that have been de designed to exploit some of these new uh, uh, targets. And uh, the sort of the theory behind that was that these treatments would be more specific um, and because they were targeting differences, they may well be more effective with fewer uh, side effects. What's emerged, um, you know, as, as research happens and we've done trials with these agents, <coughs> is firstly that although we've been able to identify many potential targets within cancers and within ovarian cancers in particular, <coughs> we've only got drugs available for a small proportion of those targets, and that's what we call actionable targets. We've also learned that we need to give many of these uh, targeted drugs alongside chemotherapy, so either you know, with the chemotherapy or as additional treatment once the chemotherapy um, has finished. So ladies still have to receive uh, their chemotherapy uh, uh, treatment. And it's also sometimes difficult to determine how important each of those targets we can find in the ovarian cancer is in, if you like, driving uh, the spread and growth of that uh, particular uh, patient and individual's uh, uh, cancer. So moving on to talk about some of the specific targeted drugs that, that we use in ovarian cancer. So the treatment that we've got most experience with is using uh, treatments that target cancer blood vessels. And this is what we call anti-angiogenic uh, treatments. So when a, when a tumour initially uh, develops, it's very small. Um, it doesn't have its own uh, uh, blood supply, and it often remains uh, dormant, doesn't cause any clinical uh, symptoms. But at some point, it goes through a process that we call the angiogenic switch. And what happens in this process is it starts producing uh, lots of proteins, lots of growth factors that stimulate the growth and development of new uh, blood vessels. And the cancer enlarges, it starts to cause symptoms. At this stage, it can start to spread elsewhere um, within the body. Now, this process of developing new blood vessels, as we said, is called angiogenesis. As we said, it's essential uh, for tumour growth um, and spread. And because it's actually involving blood vessels, um, uh, the concept was that if we can target this, uh, target this process, we may be able to develop a treatment that where we didn't see the development of resistance to treatment in, in the future, and the treatment may be more specific and safer uh, than chemotherapy. Uh, treatment. So the most important growth factor or protein that stimulates blood vessel growth in, in cancer is this protein called vascular endothelial growth factor or, or VEGF. And that's um, produced uh, by the cancer cells. It goes off um, into, the, into the circulation and in, into the environment around uh, the cancer and it binds to its receptors on endothelial cells. Now, those are the cells that line uh, blood vessels. And when it binds, it causes those cells to divide and it causes new blood vessels uh, to sprout. And we've now got drugs that can target this process in two particular ways. The one that I'm sure you'll be most familiar with is the antibody treatment, uh, bevacizumab or Avastin. And that works by binding uh, to VEGF in the circulation and stopping it binding to its receptor on the surface of the blood vessel uh, cells. The other drugs um, that uh, we've used in, in trials and hopefully will be coming through to the clinic maybe in the next uh, year or two are drugs that actually uh, block uh, the receptors and stop the receptors signaling through uh, to the, to the, to the uh, blood vessel cells. And one of those drugs um, is a drug called Sidirinib, but there are several others uh, that have been investigated. Now, the antibody treatments need to be given intravenously like chemotherapy uh, through a drip, and although they don't have the same side effects as chemotherapy, they have their own uh, particular uh, side effects and, uh, and problems. 
One of those is that in about one in five ladies that has the treatment, it can cause high uh, blood pressure that will need to be treated um, with antihypertensive uh, medications. It can also cause the kidneys to become leaky uh, to protein, which can sometimes um, cause problems with being able to continue with the treatment. But more importantly, there are some more serious, rarer uh, complications of, of these treatments affecting uh, uh, the bowel. So sometimes these antibodies can cause small holes to form in the bowel, something we call bowel uh, perforation, which can sometimes cause you know, really nasty pain and infection within the tummy and require um, an operation. And occasionally it can cause an abnormal connection to form between uh, the bowel and the bladder or the bowel and the skin, something we call a, a fistula. And we see those those problems in probably about two or three in every hundred ladies who have um, uh, Avastin uh, a treatment. The drugs that block the receptors are easier to give. They're given as a, as a tablet. They have similar side effects that we see with Avastin, but they also have some, some other side effects, um, in particular um, diarrhea um, and, 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 and tiredness. And those are side effects that we need to learn to be able to manage and help ladies with you know, if they're taking uh, these medications. So how do we use bevacizumab um, in the clinic? So as we said, we give bevacizumab alongside the chemotherapy, and then we would give it in what we call a maintenance fashion, currently for a year's uh, course in total, although there's research going on to see whether carrying on beyond that um, is more effective than stopping at a year's treatment. We always have to give a break of, of about four to six weeks after ladies had surgery because these treatments can slow down um, uh, wound healing. So we need to make sure the wound has, has, has adequately healed after, after the operation. As we said, we know these treatments are generally well uh, tolerated with um, high blood pressure being the main side effect. What we know from the trials that have been done is that these antibodies work best um, in ladies that have got visible ovarian cancer tissue left after their operation or they're unable to, to, to have an operation. So these, this treatment is not um, appropriate or um, suitable for ladies who've had very good surgery and have no uh, visible ovarian cancer uh, left after their, their operation. Avastin is, is currently approved in England through the, the Cancer Drugs uh, Fund for this group of ladies who've got um, a, a cancer left after their operation. We also know that when the cancer recurs, these treatments uh, can be effective um, alongside chemotherapy um, again, but currently um, we don't have, have access to, to, to Avastin in that setting um, in, in England. And it will postpone the recurrence of, of, of uh, the illness in, in some patients. What we would like to do is really be able to try and identify those women who are most likely to gain benefit from, from Avastin, because not everyone who has this treatment gets additional benefit, but they would all get some of the additional side effects from, <coughs> from the treatment. And there have been lots of, of, of research that's been going on to, to try and do that. And this is just one example that we've been involved in at, at Manchester. And what we've been doing is measuring um, some of the proteins within, within the circulation of ladies who are receiving uh, bevacizumab, those proteins that also seem to be important in driving uh, blood vessel uh, development. And we can measure them using fancy tests so that we can measure half a dozen of those proteins at a time in just a couple of drops of, of, of patients' uh, blood. And what we've been doing is taking those blood tests before the lady starts treatment and alongside their, their treatment whilst that's been going on uh, for 12 months. And we've been particularly interested in looking at blood before the treatment starts to see if we can find any pattern in those blood protein levels to see who will benefit from treatment, but also during the treatment to see if any changes happen which indicate that bevacizumab is, is stopping working, what we call resistant, resistance biomarkers. And we can generate very uh, complex patterns of these proteins, but what we have found is that this group of proteins here, what we call the angiopoietin, proteins, which are another family of proteins that stimulate blood vessel uh, development, may well be important in predicting which ladies are going to benefit uh, from Avastin, and also to predict those ladies who are going to develop, um, or, or where Avastin is going to stop working uh, during treatment. This is very interesting data, but there's still a lot of work for us to do before we can develop a blood test that will be available in the clinic to work out which ladies should have Avastin um, or not. What I'd like to move on now is talking about another group of drugs that are very 
topic called the PARP inhibitors and Olaparib in particular. And you've heard a bit about these this morning. And what these drugs do is they target the repair of DNA uh, uh, damage within cancer cells. And PARP inhibitors are particularly important in the most common type of ovarian cancer, high-grade serous um, ovarian cancer. And this is a type of ovarian cancer that initially tends to respond very well to our chemotherapy treatment, but often recurs. And as you've learned this morning, this type of ovarian cancer is often linked to faults in the BRCA uh, gene, so either inherited uh, mutations or where those mutations occur in the tumour during the development of, of the cancer. And if you have a fault in your BRCA genes, those cells are unable to repair damage to DNA as effectively as, as normal uh, cells. And this, is, this weakness is what um, the PARP inhibitors target. So what I want to do is try and talk you through uh, this slide, which tells us how PARP inhibitors work. So on the left-hand side, A, we have, have a normal cell, and there are two very important pathways that repair damage that occurs to, our, to the DNA uh, within cells as they, as they divide. One of those is dependent on the BRCA protein, and the other is dependent on another family of proteins called the PARP protein. So in normal cells, both of those um, pathways are working uh, properly. If we go across to the second figure, B, this is in uh, cells which have got a, a mutation in, in, in their BRCA uh, genes. So that second pathway on the left, a homologous recombination pathway, uh, doesn't work properly. But the cells can still repair the majority of the damage through the other uh, PARP-dependent um, uh, pathways. If we move right across now to the right-hand side to D, so what we're looking at here is, is cancer cells that have got a BRCA mutation, and we now give them our drug, our PARP inhibitor, to block that second pathway. Those cancer cells then find it very difficult to repair any damage that's happening to their DNA, and lots of mistakes build up to such an extent that the cell becomes unstable and the cancer cell uh, uh, dies. Now, the most important of these drugs, the PARP inhibitor, is this drug uh, called Olaparib, uh, which is taken um, in, in capsule form. And ladies need to take eight of these capsules uh, twice a day. And it's now been investigated um, extensively um, in clinical trials. What we know from these trials is that this drug is most effective in ladies after their cancer has been reduced uh, by chemotherapy. And we give it in what we call a maintenance uh, treatment, so to try and prolong the benefit that, w that has been gained from the chemotherapy uh, course. And the trials su suggest that if you take a laparib, we can maintain that chemotherapy benefit for longer, by almost seven months longer on average in one trial in women who had an inherited uh, BRCA mutation causing their ovarian cancer. And what we know from that trial now is that one in 10 ladies who started a laparib actually carried on that treatment for more than five years. So in a small proportion of, 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 of ladies with a BRCA uh, inherited associated ovarian cancer, this treatment can be very effective in maintaining the benefit of chemotherapy and keeping the cancer under control. And Olaparib is now NICE approved uh, for use in, in England really very recently. We've only really had this drug routinely available to us in, in Manchester since the end of, of, of April. And it's approved for ladies who've got a, a BRCA mutation associated ovarian cancer after they've responded well to their third or further uh, course of, of, of chemotherapy treatment. But again, these treatments do have some side effects. Most ladies will manage these treatments well, but they do cause tiredness, nausea, diarrhea, and occasionally they can cause problems with low blood counts. Normally, we can manage these side effects very well by giving ladies short breaks, so maybe a week or two holiday from taking the Olaparib, or sometimes cutting uh, the dose of the Olaparib tablets uh, down a little bit. But what we want to do is see whether we can find other groups of ladies who do not have an inherited BRCA mutation that might benefit from these types of <coughs> treatments. Now, there are lots of other PARP inhibitors that are out there, and one of them is a drug um, called uh, Rucaparib, and that's another uh, tablet treatment for ovarian cancer. And this is some work that's been done by Professor McNeish um, in Glasgow, um, who's done some tumour testing on patients with high-grade serous ovarian cancer who are starting rocaparib as a treatment for their ovarian cancer when the cancer has returned. And he was able to develop a genetic signature to tell him which of those tumours looked similar 
for the tumours in ladies who had an inherited uh, BRCA mutation. And what he could do is he could divide the ladies who went into the study up into three groups. So the first group was that group who had um, an inherited BRCA mutation. That was a quarter of the ladies who went into the trial. And the majority of those ladies gained some benefit from taking the Recaparib uh, tablets. In those ladies who didn't have a BRCA mutation, he could divide those up into two groups. Those whose genetic signature that he found made them look like a BRCA mutation tumour and those whose signature looked completely different. In those that had a BRCA-like signature, some of those ladies gained benefit from, from taking uh, Recaparib. In those who didn't have uh, the signature, the benefit from Recaparib was very unlikely. So again, this is very early work, but it's telling us that again, hopefully in the next five or ten years, we will be able to um, predict more accurately which ladies will be able to gain benefit uh, from Recaparib and, also, uh, and PARP inhibitors, and also potentially pick out those ladies who are unlikely uh, to gain benefit from these treatments. The other strategy that's, that's being looked at at the moment is seeing whether we can combine these PARP inhibitors with some of the anti blood vessel uh, treatments that we've talked about um, earlier. And there are two large trials that are now um, ongoing looking at these combinations. So there's a, there's a trial in Europe looking at the combination of Avastin and Alaprib um, in the initial treatment of ladies with ovarian cancer. And there's a trial that's going to be start, starting the ICON-9 trial um, in the UK, which is looking at giving sidirinib and Alaprib as part of the treatment in ladies whose cancers has recurred and are due to start at more chemotherapy. The final target that I want to talk about is something that I'm sure a lot of you will have, will have heard about, and that's looking at immunotherapy, so trying to um, use the body's immune system um, to control and attack the cancer. And this is a really very exciting um, area that the science, one of the most important um, uh, medical journals, identified as, as the breakthrough of the year two or three um, uh, years ago. So how, does, how do these treatments work? Well, the aim of these treatments is to try to get the, your own or the body's own immune system to start attacking um, cancer cells. And the most important cells that do that are something that we call uh, the T cells. Their normal function in the body is to go around everywhere and scout out any, any cells that have got abnormal proteins on the cell surface and to eliminate those. And those would normally be cells that have got infections, so cells that have got viruses or parasites in, inside them. What we know is that many tumour cells, because of the problems in their DNA, have got um, slightly altered proteins on their cell surface, what we call um, antigens. And T cells will often recognise those antigens, but cancer cells are clever. And what they do is they shut down um, the ability of um, the T cells to to um, um, eliminate uh, the tumour cells. Okay, so we had the T cell recognising the abnormal protein, the antigen on, on, on the tumour cell, and that would normally stimulate it to attack, but what the tumour cell has also on its surface is another protein, what we call the PDL1 uh, protein, which does the opposite, and that actually turns off uh, the T cell. So that actually stops the immune system actually um, attacking uh, the cancer cell. And as we've increased our, our knowledge of, of, of these systems, clever scientists have now developed uh, drugs um, that can actually um, block um, this signal between um, PDL1 um, and the T cells. So hopefully, stimulate, re-stimulate the immune system to eliminate the cancer. And these are called checkpoint inhibitors. And the treatments that are coming through into the clinic are antibody treatments like Avastin. So they're given into the veins once every, once every few weeks. And these treatments have really had an impressive track record in some other types of cancers. So they've actually revolutionised the treatment of melanoma, which is a particularly aggressive uh, form um, of skin cancer. But they've also been, been licensed for the treatment of, uh, of lung cancer. They do have uh, their own particular side effects that we need to to learn uh, to manage, and some of these are because, they, because they're making the immune system more active, they actually um, cause inflammation in some of the normal body uh, tissues. Um, and one of those that you know, may be a particularly important ovarian cancer is that some ladies develop inflammation in the bowels that we call colitis, which can cause diarrhea and abdominal 
uh, pain, so can mimic some of the symptoms that we would see from recurrent ovarian cancer. There have been some promising early results in ovarian uh, cancer, but these have been very, very small trials. So we're looking at trials, looking at 20 or, or, or 30 ladies. And so it's clear that much more research um, is needed to see the, the true benefit that these treatments might give uh, to ladies um, with uh, recurrent ovarian cancer. And there are three trials that are going to be starting um, in many hospitals in, in the UK in the next six months that are looking at some of these drugs. So the Keynote 100 trial is looking at an antibody called pembrolizumab in ladies whose ovarian cancer has recurred. And there are two Javelin trials looking at another drug called avelumab, but one again in ovarian cancer that's recurred, but also one that will be looking at these treatments as a component of the initial treatment alongside <coughs> surgery um, and uh, chemotherapy. So we've talked about um, targeted treatments for high-grade serous ovarian cancer and, and PARP inhibitors. What about some of the uh, less common types of ovarian uh, cancer? Well, there are trials in clear cell uh, cancer looking at uh, both antiangiogenic treatments, so blood vessel blockers, but also at, at other groups uh, of treatments, such as the PI3 kinase um, inhibitors, which block a signaling pathway that's um, overactive in clear cell cancer. And then in low-grade serous um, uh, cancer, a, a type of, of cancer where chemotherapy is, is not as effective as high-grade serous cancer, there are some interesting uh, trials looking at, at two um, types of treatment. Firstly, the MEK inhibitors, but also, very interestingly, hormone treatment. So these are drugs like tamoxifen and letrozole that are used very frequently for, for breast cancer. And um, we're getting more and more information to suggest that these treatments may be you know, at least as effective as chemotherapy um, in treating low-grade serous cancer, but come uh, with significantly fewer side effects. So in summary, what I've tried to, to give you today is a flavour for, for the fact that targeted treatments are now becoming part of the mainstream treatment for ovarian uh, cancer. And we've talked about um, bevacizumab and olaparib. There are many others in, in development, of immunotherapy of which is one uh, very um, interesting group of, of drugs. But chemotherapy is still a, very, still a key part of, of our drug treatment for most ladies who've got ovarian cancer. I think you know, our expectation is that in the future, so over the next five or ten years, we'll learn much more about which patients these particular treatments are, are likely to be most effective in, and that will hopefully be able to tailor our treatment for each individual patient. But we're certainly not at that point uh, yet. And as I said, I think you know, we've got a lot more uh, to learn. Thank you very much for listening.